We're on the last one. Now we're reviewing the Intel, let me just get the name right, Core Ultra 7 265K space dash space Core Ultra 7 space left parentheses Series 2 right parentheses Arrow Lake 20 core 8P plus 12E LGA 1851 125W desktop processor. We initially found the Series 2 part of that to be confusing, but it actually all makes sense because 200 series, it's kind of like two. Anyway, the point is these names are very clear and won't cause any problems. So this is going to be the simplest and shortest of our three reviews for Intel Aero, Aero Lake. Sorry, I was the... Uh, Blue screen back there is mixing me up. And this one, uh, we're going to focus on basically just the charts. We'll look at efficiency, gaming, production. If you want the full in-depth everything, the 285K review is like almost 39 minutes, and that covers everything. So it goes into the efficiency in a lot more detail. We're not going to do all that again here. Check that review out for the full background uh, on Arrow Lake in general, including discussion of the blue screens of death and some of the other stuff we were talking about in that piece where it's just not really ready for launch, in our opinion. The 265K is currently available for $404 on Newegg and Amazon right now. That puts it predictably between the $630 285K and the $320 to $330 245K. As a recap, thus far, the 245K has made the least sense since it's more gaming oriented and less focused on potential workstation applications, whereas the 285K could maybe make an argument in some workstation or production use cases. The 265K theoretically balances between them. But that's what we're gonna find out today in the last of the three, for now, Aero Lake reviews. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Tower 600 case. The Tower 600 is a vertical case design with Thermaltake's unique showcase presentation which stands out further with its separate chassis stand kit that rotates the case for an angled showpiece. The Tower 600 is heavily ventilated around the sides, has a ton of radiator support including up to 420mm solutions, and offers two GPU mounting options for display and cooling optimization. It also comes in colors not commonly seen in cases. Learn more about the Tower 600 at the link in the description below. We'll start again with a quick pricing recap for what's available now around the time of writing this review. So the 265K again is $404, which is fitting because Error Lake value can't be found. The price has it similar to the 7900X, which is currently $400. The 7900X is $370 or so, with the 9700X at $330. The 9900X is $430. AMD has this territory completely encircled with similarly priced options. The 7800X 3D comes in 19% more expensive at $480 and would be less viable in production use cases we test, but far more viable in gaming scenarios. If you're only doing one of those two types of workload typically, that allows you to either ignore or focus on the 7800X 3D. If you're doing both, that'd be where the 265K might make sense. Basically, if you're splitting your daily use of the computer between really heavy work type applications and gaming. If it's not beaten by Intel's own 14700K at $350 or it's 13700K at $290, that would be where the 265K has a chance. And then AMD has also announced it's 9800X3D, or whatever they call it, for November 7th. Uh, we're not sure what it's gonna cost yet. It is very likely it's not a direct comparison unless they really surprise everyone with the pricing, just because we'd expect it to be at 7800X3D levels or higher. And that right now is 480 bucks. It's been as low as in the 300s in the past, but hasn't been there for a little while. So uh, as a reminder, other considerations for Arrow Lake, again, include the entirely new platform. So Z890 LGA 1851 uh, means you'd be buying into a new board. These boards are some of the most expensive we've ever seen for this class. And in some cases we've seen, it can also be benefited disproportionately by higher memory speed but that gets uh, more expensive than potentially just buying one of the other CPUs that can cut costs and corners. As a positive though, the reduced power consumption means reduced cooler requirements. As compared to Intel prior generations, it's not gonna be as compared to AMD, it's lower power, generally speaking across the board. Some uh, 9950X, stuff like that uh, are a little different. But anyway, that's kind of where it lines up and that's it for the basics and the position. If you want more, check out any of the last videos. We'll link them all in the description for you to make it easy. And uh, otherwise, let's just get right into it this time. Our efficiency testing has been explained in depth in two pieces now and briefly introduced in a third. 
To learn more about what we're doing here, check out our 285K review and our preceding video where we set up our monstrous test bench that you're looking at now. We'll start with 7-zip compression efficiency. We're just going to go with the ATX 12 volt and EPS 12 volt rails for this because we think these are the closest to accurate on our setup. The 265K ended up at 163 watts in this test, which has the efficiency at 968 MIPS per watt. That has the CPU as less efficient than the 285K, which pulled 162 watts on the same ATX 12 volt and EPS 12 volt rails, but produced a higher throughput, yielding a 1051 MIPS per watt result. AMD is 7800X 3D, 7700, 9700X, and uh, everything else, including the 3700X from 2019, ranks above the 265K result. The 265K really is only better than the 9950X, the 2700, the 5800X, and Intel's own lineup here. In decompression efficiency, the 265K repeats its rank and falls below the 1194.9 MIPS per watt result of the 285K. The power drawn is the same since this test suite runs both consecutively and at about the same power level. The end result is that the 265K is marginally less efficient than the 245K, more meaningfully behind the 285K, and is otherwise mostly just ahead of the prior Intel CPUs. Generationally, the improvement on the 14700K is actually good. It's 47%, so that's a real uplift, and Intel does deserve credit for that once again. However, the entire top half of the chart is AMD dominated. It's just not even close. So the 7950X in eco mode, for example, leads the 265K in efficiency with an advantage of 87%. The 9700X is cheaper and also holds a substantial lead up at 1624 MIPS per watt. The 9700X won't produce as high of a result in this test as the 265K will for raw performance, but in efficiency, it is more efficient. Even the 9950X, which is AMD's highest power draw non-HEDT part that we're testing right now, is more efficient than the 265K. This is partly because its performance is so much higher in this test. Now for gaming efficiency testing, this is still imperfect and it's something we're still developing. So we're gonna keep tuning this. There'll be some changes as we continue to iterate on the gaming efficiency benchmarks. Uh, mostly because of Asus's change to pull from the 24 pin. That's really complicated things for us. So this is what we've got. We feel pretty good about it overall. It's calibrated. Uh, we want to do some further finer tuning though. So just be aware of that. All right. So here the 265K pulled 89 watts when measuring both the ATX 12 volt and the EPS 12 volt rails. That has it similar to the 285K. We noticed during this testing an initially higher reading on the 265K. It was almost 10 watts exactly, but after troubleshooting vCore, CPU package power, and a bunch of other power numbers in the charts, we were able to isolate that 10 watts as being from a measurement tool difference on the 265K platform that we used, and we were able to make adjustments to effectively calibrate it for the data, uh, so this is all comparable. As we've stated, this is, again, just because of ASUS's decisions. Honestly, we might just move away from them for power testing in the future if that's easier, but we'll see how things develop. With the 89 watt measurement, the 265K ends up just below the 285K for efficiency tied when rounded. Its performance is lower, but power is similar, so the two are effectively equal. The TDP is the same on these CPUs, so if they're drawing up to the power limit, then this is expected. Neither of these is particularly impressive when considering the 7800X3D or the 5700X3D, both of which have higher frame rate and lower power consumption, resulting in higher efficiency. The 245K is more efficient than the 285K and the 265K, up at 1.3 FPS per watt and tied with the 7700 and 9700X. In Final Fantasy XIV, the 265K calibrated to prior tests pulled 65 and a half watts during our testing. We didn't add a line item for the ATX 5V one uh, since we've been saying we don't think that has much impact on the CPU in a significant way and we haven't really been using it. So this lands the 265K at around the same power consumption as the 285K when you look at the same two rails. The efficiency is lower because the frame rate is lower on the 265. The 245K is more efficient up at 4.3 FPS per watt. Then the 265K ends up being the least efficient of these three parts so far on this chart. It's still improved with the 14700K, but because the performance is regressive in this particular title, and actually by a lot, the efficiency struggles to take off despite the reduction in power consumption from what was 98.2 watts. The 7800X3D has an efficiency lead at 8.3 FPS per watt, or a 131% improvement, which is actual insanity. The large frame rate boost combined with the steep power reduction gives AMD a big lead here. Again, whether you're talking outright efficiency or environmental stewardship and absolute power consumption, the answer to both of these would be AMD as the most efficient right now. Uh, Intel just can't really fight on these grounds despite its improvements over its own prior architecture. Stellaris is up next. In this one, we have the 265K at 1.5 simulations per watt hour, about the same as the 5800X, especially considering rounding. If we look for a performance normalized comparison, the closest would be Intel's own 14700K, 
the uplift over the predecessor is 50%. AMD's 9600X is somewhat close in performance as well, yet it holds an advantage at 1.7 simulations per watt hour. We didn't capture power data for the 245K on Starfield, but we do have the 265 and 285. The 265K here pulled 144 watts, putting it around the same as the 285K. Because the performance declines and the power is the same, the efficiency is worse than the 285K once again. 285K appears to be a better bin in combination with higher efficiency. The 265K ends up about the same as the 14600K. Fortunately, it improves on the 14700K's 0.6 FPS per watt result. Uh, the 14900K has a lower power consumption than the 147 as a result of external bottlenecking limiting CPU utilization also bending. It can't fully be leveraged, and so that's why we see that difference there. 285K and 265K are both fully engaged, though. Dragon's Dogma 2 is up. In this one, the 265K ran at 99 FPS average, which has it 4.6% ahead of the 245K, and it has the 285K about 4 to 5 FPS ahead of the 265K. The 14700K leads the 265K by 8.6%, with the 13700K about the same. The AMD 7800X3D is ahead by 11%, with the cheaper 5700X3D also ahead of the 265K while running on an older, cheaper platform. The 265K is worse value than even the 245K in this particular game, and we wouldn't recommend that one either. Its low performance here is fine, with no particularly meaningful deviation from the expectation, but overall, the 265K is just not impressive in this test, even against its already unimpressive brethren of the same 200 series, or series 2, or whatever Intel is calling it. F124 is up now. In the very least, the gap is wider against the 245K, now with a 7.5% uplift in frame rate. Lows increased proportionally with the average. Uh, this positions the 265K as equivalent to the AMD 7700X and a bit ahead of the 7700 and 7900 non-X parts. The 7900X is functionally tied with the 265K, making it both performance and price matched in this test, at least the prices around the time of launch when we're writing this. The 285K's 342.5 FPS average has it just 4% ahead of the 265K. It wouldn't be worth buying the $630 285K basically regardless in any situation, but definitely not in gaming situations, but the 285K is especially not worth it here. Even the 265K makes more sense, and it still doesn't make a ton of sense. The 5700X3D further establishes this storyline with its 355 FPS results. It is led by the once upon a time cheaper 5600X3D when it was briefly available at Micro Center due to the uh, frequency bump, and ultimately both of these just kind of show the poor value of the 265 and 285. At 1440p, we see some drop in performance from the resolution change, but a similar hierarchy overall. The 265K ends up sandwiched between the 14600K and 13600K as we bounce off of occasional frame rate limits. The entire top of the chart is brushing against external bottlenecks, at least occasionally, so let's just move on. Final Fantasy XIV Dawn trails up now, first at 1080p. AMD holds a domineering lead over this chart and keeps a stranglehold on the top three entries, with the fourth held closely against the 14900K with APO on. The 265K landed at 236 FPS average here, which has the 12900K ahead of it by 4%. The R9 7900 non-X also leads up at 253 FPS average and holding an advantage of 7.4%. Even the 7600X leads here. The 14700K's 287 FPS average has it 21.7% ahead of the 265K, establishing without a doubt that the 265K has gotten thoroughly wrecked in this test against its predecessor. The 285K also did poorly in this game. In fact, this is one of the games that Intel openly stated has regressive performance, and we can definitely confirm that. Almost anything else makes more sense than Arrow Lake in this benchmark. Baldur's Gate 3 had the 265K at 96 FPS average, which ties it almost perfectly with the 12900K. That includes tying the 1% lows with 0.1% close to the usual wider error range. The 265K only leads the 245K by a few FPS on average, rendering it relatively uninteresting. The 245K was already terrible value against the alternatives here, and that includes not just the clearly dominant X3D CPUs, where we have four and likely soon to be five topping the chart, but also Intel's own prior CPUs. The 14700K leads the 265K by 6%. And for perspective, the 7800X3D leads it by 32%. The 5800X3D isn't far below that at 120 FPS average. 5700X3D, which is around 200 to 230 typically, but it has been cheaper, has an advantage over the 265K of 16.4%. So for the 265, we're just not really seeing it for this one, despite 
at least being better value than the 285k, which was completely insane at its price. Stellaris is up now. This one uses a late game save file to test for simulation time rather than frame rate. Players of 4x games are likely aware of how bogged down the CPU can get in late game stages. Uh, this is something that I see a lot in Galactic Civilizations 4, for example. The 265K required an average of 33.9 seconds for its simulation. The 13900K averaged 33.5 seconds, with the 7700 non-X at 34.2. Lower is better here. The 14700K predecessor is indistinguishable from the 14900K here, with both exhibiting a 2% simulation time reduction from the 265K. The 9600X is also improved with a simulation time reduction of 1.2 seconds. Zen 5 generally does well in this test, shown with the 9700X at the top. This is also something we saw back in our Zen 5 review cycle, where we had a completely different uh, set of tests for this game, but it all kind of landed in the same hierarchy. The 285K with our default settings did better in this one relative to the 14 series than other tests as compared to each other but it was still beaten by AMD's 7800X 3D and 9700X. Rainbow Six Siege is up now. In this test, the 265K ran at 519 FPS average. We observed that the 285K had frame time pacing issues in this game as compared to the 14 series, which persist here. Our 285K review remarked that we think this may be related to specific optimizations made by the Rainbow Six team, as APO's benefit has been reduced to effectively nothing. By average FPS, the 265K is behind the 5700X 3D and further behind the higher clocks 5600X3D. Both of these AMD CPUs have better 0.1% lows. However, the 14600K has far superior 0.1% lows than all three of these and is functionally tied in average FPS with the 265K. It's within error for average, but better in low performance, so it's just better. The same goes for the 13600K, although the average is outside of error, but it's just a better performing part generally. And this is all kind of embarrassing for the 265K. Here's how it stacks up. The 7800X UD leads the 265K by 20%. The 9600X leads it by 19%. The 14900K with APO off leads it by 13%. And the 285K with APO off leads it by 12%. Even the 7900X leads here, and that's not explicitly branded as a gaming part. Yet it competes in both production workloads and price. Uh, and in this particular game. Starfield's up now. This one has the 265K at 134 FPS average, just ahead of the 5800X 3D and behind the 13700K and 14700K. These two CPUs and the 14900K are all bouncing off of another limit, and the 285K with DDR5-8600 makes it appear as if that limit is memory. This is also reinforced by the cache boosted 7800X 3D propelling to the top here. The 265K has an improvement on the 245K's average FPS of 120.5 of 11%. It also leads the 5700X 3D by 13% here. AMD has historically had issues with Starfield on its CPUs despite being the GPU sponsor for the game. The 9600X is less competitive in this game than uh, some of the other tests, down at 101 FPS average. Time to move to production benchmarks. This testing will look at a shortened list of workstation applications. Blender's up first for a 3D rendering benchmark. In this one, the 265K required 8.7 seven minutes to complete the render that has it near the 14900k against the 14700k the 265k also benefits from a render time reduction of eight percent meaning eight percent less time required to complete the same work the reduction in time required against the 13700k is 20 percent down from almost 11 minutes AMD 7950X in eco mode leads the 265K with an 8% reduction in render time needed, with the non-eco result at 7.4 minutes and in line behind the 285K. The 265K beats the 7900X, which at least helps its positioning against similarly priced AMD competition. It's not always the case. The 265K also benefits from a 31% reduction in render time requirement against the 245K. This is a direct result of the increased core and thread count uh, because Blender is heavily threaded and it's not quite linear, but the scaling is pretty predictable. 7-zip compression's up now. In this test, the 265K ran at 158,000 MIPS, which puts it roughly tied with AMD's R9 7900X and behind the 9900X. The 265K improves on the 245K by 29% in throughput, with the 285K leading the 265K by 8%. This is a test where we saw a large improvement from the memory upgrade in our 285K test with DDR5-8600. We might revisit that topic if we can find some time to just explore it a little more. The 9900X is about 6% more expensive than the 265K right now and performs about 3.5% better. The 14700K is cheaper than the 265K, but uses more power to score 8% better. The 7950X is one of the more interesting CPUs still, but it depends heavily on price at the time you're looking for it. It's listed as $500 as we write this, 
or about 24% more than the $405 listing for the 265K on Newegg. The 7950X performs 18% better without eco mode and uh, similarly with it enabled. Decompression has the 265K at 168,000 MIPS and landed just behind the two generation old 13700K. The refreshed version of that, the 14.7, is up at 195,000 MIPS, landing the 14.700K ahead of both the 285K and the 265K. The 285K only topples it when upgraded with faster memory, but of course, giving the same treatment to the 14.700K would also leapfrog that one ahead. The 14.700K leads the 265K by 15.7%, the 265K leads AMD's 7700X by 19%, X3D doesn't really help here, so the 7800X3D and 5700X3D fall down the stack comparatively, despite strong gaming performance and actually really good efficiency. AMD's production-oriented 7900X leads the 265K by a staggering 24%, with the 9900X leading by 27%. The 7900X is currently the same price as the 265K, making it a better value in this comparison. Adobe Premiere is up next, tested with the Puget Suite. In this one, the 265K scored 10,718 points in aggregate, Puget Systems takes the intraframe score, raw score, GPU effective uh, processing, and other filter and editing testing into consideration for this score. The score has it roughly tied with the Eco Mode 7950X result and the 9900X result. Its advantage over the 7900X is at least a little more at 8%, and the 7900 non X scored similarly. The 265K also leads the 13700K by 1%. It's basically error, though. The 14700K leads the 265K by 2.4%. And the 285K did well in this particular test. It managed to outrank the 14900K, leading the 265K by 5.8%. So that's it for this one. A couple things to point out here. The 265K is, in several of the cases that we've tested, less efficient than the 285K. A couple reasons for that. One is efficiency, again, is a calculation involving the uh, power consumed doing a task and then the actual output of that task. And so 285K performs better in those tasks. That's going to bump it positively. It is still more efficient than its predecessor from the 14th gen, but it's not always more performant. So that's kind of the trade off. Now, in all comparisons we run, AMD is more efficient still. And that kind of wraps up that side of the uh, efficiency equation. As we recap the charts overall, it's clear once again that the 265K is surrounded by good options on all sides. The 285K is exceptionally bad value for gaming users. It is actually impressive how bad the value is. The performance is worse than what you'd get on a $230 5700X3D in a lot of cases for the 285K or a $480 7800X3D in all cases for gaming. And uh, also, it costs a lot more than the 7800X3D. So that's the 285K. In non-gaming uses, there are some limited scenarios where you could make an argument for the 285K, but they are relatively rare among our test suite in terms of the value proposition. Uh, the 245K made even less sense. The production use cases effectively vanish as an argument, as the part is majority targeted at gaming users in that mainstream market. In gaming, it gets absolutely crushed by not only AMD's $100 cheaper options, like the 57X3D, which itself would give you either $100 more to keep or to throw out a GPU and definitely not spend on a Z890 board. But the 245K is also bested by Intel's own predecessors that are now cheaper or the same price, as we talked about in that review. The 265K suffers from a bit of both. The cost goes up from the 245K by $70 to $90, depending on where you look. And yet the performance doesn't really scale anywhere close to linearly with that price increase in gaming. The production performance is better. And in that situation, almost solely, the 265K can make some stronger arguments for itself. It can outmatch its closest price competitors from AMD at times, so that's good for the 265K. The efficiency's improved, not as good as AMD, definitely better than older Intel. And it's just that ultimately it's not a sweeping victory for Intel. It is, there is no clear reason to buy one of these three parts. There are reasons you can make to buy them, but there, it's not like, you know, the seven, if someone asks us, what sh I'm building a gaming computer. My focus is gaming, what should I buy? Then our answers are based on your budget, 7800X3D, 5700X3D, and it kind of stops there. I mean, you can you make an argument for older Intel, especially with the prices coming down, but those two make the most sense depending on the budget the user has. Uh, getting cheaper, Intel starts to make more sense, like the 12600KF was something like $80 recently at Best Buy, so that's kind of crazy. But otherwise, that's kind of how it stacks up. And then for Production use cases, uh, again, it's you can make an argument in some of these applications 
it's just not not a sweeping victory and Arrow Lake has external issues where Intel, as we said in the 285K review, didn't even know what it was shipping. It asserted very clearly that APO would be on by default on everything. And that's back to 13th gen. And it simply was not. And while APO is, uh, has no real impact in our test suite, which is why we, we didn't include it here again, because like at most we were seeing on the 14 series 1.9%, and on the 200 series, we're seeing basically zero. But while it has almost no impact, the fact of the matter is Intel doesn't have it together and doesn't know what it's shipping out the door and is uh, misrepresenting the product. And that's not good. They also had issues with the Windows setup in some situations, as we discussed. Now, that's shared responsibility with NVIDIA. Uh, and then additionally, they have the easy anti-cheat issues. Uh, and there's a couple other things we talked about, too, in the 285K review. So, it's just not there right now. We can't make a recommendation really for any of these three. We kind of make an argument in some situations, but uh, we're not, it's just not there yet. So anyway, that'll wrap these three reviews for now. We have more Arrow Lake content, but as far as the core part reviews, they're done until Intel launches more stuff. Check back for our other coverage. We have a separate thermal, mechanical, and laser scan piece going up of the Arrow Lake parts that looks at the different ILMs. So Intel's got three different vendors for the ILMs and they've got two different types. Uh, and so we'll, we tested all those and we'll have that data for you soon. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. It's a very simple one. So uh, for more detail, check back on the others and you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to throw a few bucks our way to help us out or store.gamersnexus.net and we'll see you all next time.